People's Temple drank punch laced with cyanide, committing mass suicide on orders from self-proclaimed Messiah, Reverend Jim Jones. The bodies are grim testimony to how destructive a cult can become. Ever since these tragic events, experts have been intensifying efforts to identify cults and warn the public of their potential dangers. It is estimated there are now more than 2,000 cults in this country. Most are not as visible as Jonestown. They hide behind what appear to be religions or legitimate businesses claiming to provide a needed service. For example, Chung Mu Kwan, a chain of martial arts schools in the suburbs offering classes in self-defense. The William Healing Temple, promising spiritual comfort to the inner city poor. The Church of Scientology, attracting members through business management courses that promise increased profits for medical professionals. In this program, you'll hear from victims of these cults, not just impressionable adolescents, but well-educated professionals lured into groups that took their money and manipulated their minds. Some will talk of fear and fraud and threats of violence. Others will talk of blackmail and brainwashing. In one cult, people have died following the advice of their leader. Many of those who talked with us asked for anonymity because they're afraid. They're speaking out so others don't fall into the same trap. They say that behind all the mystical symbols and philosophy, the pseudoscience and psychology, the religion and the rhetoric, lie dangerous organizations that are cults and cons. The schools of Chung Mu Kwan are scattered throughout the Chicago suburbs and in Massachusetts, Minnesota, California, and Texas. They attract students of all ages, teaching what they claim is eight martial arts in one. Instructors say that by developing a strong mind and body, students learn not only self-defense, but also to understand themselves and find true happiness. Joe Zimhart has deprogrammed several former Chung Mu Kwan students. He says the schools are not what they seem to be. It fits every single definition of a cult which I have studied. All cults have certain common characteristics. They have charismatic leaders claiming to possess mystical powers, secret knowledge, and promising salvation. <laughs> Chung Mu Kwan schools were founded by John C. Kim, a former maintenance man. School signs proclaim him martial arts champion of all Asia. But martial arts officials say there's never been such a title. School posters show Kim demonstrating Chung Mu Kwan techniques, crouching like a tiger, soaring like an eagle, using his whole body as a weapon to attack. Former followers were told he had supernatural powers. Many believed it. It was said that he had uh, a lot of healing powers, that he could essentially heal anything. They told us that when he was in the room, you could see uh, aura, a halo around him. I thought I was going to learn the secrets to life, to deeper, to deeper meaning of life. He had a third eye in his forehead. That explained what? That he could read your mind. His powers were phenomenal. They made him seem like a, a god to us. Cults recruit followers by targeting vulnerable people, those who are lonely, lack direction, or self-esteem. <laughs> Former instructors say Chung Mu Kwan schools kept dossiers on students, which detailed just that kind of personal information. We looked for people's weaknesses. We would spend time in groups going over each individual student uh, and determining how to best hit their mind, as it was put. You can convince them, hey, your life is terrible. Look at your job. Look at how people treat you. Look at how your wife and family are. You need to improve all of that, and I'm going to show you how to do it. Then that's when they get into higher courses and you become a better instructor. Cults also manipulate their followers by using mind control techniques. In Chung Mu Kwan, experts say the mind control begins with the martial arts training. 
physically wearing down students by ordering them to constantly repeat movements or hold poses for long periods of time. What happens is that they go into an altered state of consciousness. In that type of altered state, they be, they're very susceptible to suggestions. It's the same kind of thing that takes place in a hypnotic trance. Students say they were worked to the point of exhaustion. They would control how much you would sleep even and keep you there late at night practicing so you'd be more tired and more vulnerable. One woman says her son became obsessed. It was like a brainwashing. His whole life was waiting for someone else to dictate to him what to do, when to eat, when to move, when to breathe. They slowly brainwash you to the point you believe anything they tell you. And when students say they felt like they were brainwashed? Brainwashed? There is, quote, brainwashing going on in this organization. Mind control? Definitely mind control. Cults alienate their members from families and friends who might question their conduct. Chung Mu Kwan instructors have urged students to abandon their future plans, saying lessons were a better education than college and that marriage would get in the way of training. Instead, students were pressured to move in with other believers. Why was that done? They have more control over you, so if you had no other outside influence other than through Chung Mu Kwan. This woman's son was living with Chung Mu Kwan students when he was seriously injured on the job and couldn't walk. Doctors released him to his mother's care, but after he talked to his Chung Mu Kwan instructor, other students came to her house and took her son away. And my son said, I made a mistake. I should not have returned to the home of my parents. And so, my husband and I argued with him, with our son, and with the people taking him out. But there was, like, a wall we were arguing with. They weren't hearing us. In time, the injury healed, but her son stayed with Chung Mu Kwan. My son, um, his entire life, all that he is, all that he will be, appears to be owned by Chung Mu Kwan. You feel like you've lost your son to Chung Mu Kwan? Oh, very much so, yes. Almost like he died. Cults are not illegal. There are no laws that prohibit them. But cults often exploit their members financially, and that's where the law can step in to protect the public from being conned. For example, in Illinois, it's illegal for any martial arts school to sign students to contracts for lessons exceeding $2,500 per year. Students must be given copies of their contracts, and schools cannot use deceptive or coercive sales tactics. At first, Chung Mu Kwan classes are relatively inexpensive, but once enrolled, former students were pressured to sign a series of increasingly expensive contracts. There was a black belt course for ten to fifteen thousand dollars, the Olympic course for five thousand, the instructor course for twenty to thirty thousand. Before contracts were signed. Students say instructors put them through strenuous workouts and humiliated, even hurt them during class. By the time I would get a student into the office, hopefully he's very intimidated and willing to accept my direction and my word. And your direction would be? My direction would be to get him in a black belt course. Sign on the dotted line. Yes. Chung Mu Kwan students say they did not get copies of their contracts and were told it's disrespectful to ask for them. I said, may I please have a copy of that? Well, there's no, what's the matter? Don't you trust us? And far be it for me to tell somebody who can terminate my life in two seconds, you know, you know I don't trust you. Students were told that to show their respect, they must pay for their lessons in cash. Some former students speculate there might be another reason. Well, I'm no dummy. I know why they wanted cash. Why? <laughs> so I don't have to report it. Good, it goes right into your pocket, for Christ's sake. To get cash, students were urged to sell their cars and use up their savings. Students with few possessions were badgered with questions. Did you have any stocks or bonds that you could sell? Did you have a grandparent or a relative with money that would be willing to finance your black belt program? 
They wanted your money. That's all they wanted was your money. Some students were so intimidated, they even turned their paychecks over to the school and got an allowance from instructors for living expenses. But sometimes it just wasn't enough to live on. One woman caught her son going through her jewelry box and even stealing food. And I said, if you're that hungry, I'll feed you, but I really don't want you stealing from me. Former instructors say they were exploited as much as the students, paying for their own lessons while working for little or no salary and only promises of financial security. In just two years, Jeff Austin signed three contracts for lessons, the largest for $36,000. At one point, school officials almost convinced him to sell his real estate business and sign a fourth contract, a certificate course that cost as much as $100,000. $100,000 to get what? I'm not sure. <laughs> At that point, who cared? <laughs> he can laugh now because he's had extensive counseling from Joe Zimhart. The mind control in this organization has them believing that the quicker they pay it off, the more righteous or more direction they have within the organization, the more loyalty they have to Chung Mu Kwan uh, ideas. And so it behooves them to pay it off quickly, and therefore they generally drain their bank accounts quite rapidly. Jeff Austin says by the time he finally quit Chung Mu Kwan, John C. Kim personally awarded him a black belt, even though Austin had not taken the test for it. It was one of the many events that finally made him realize students were being conned into believing the schools were legitimate. But the things they're doing are completely contradictory to that. What are they doing? They're conning people. The final con, this card given to students showing their rank was registered with the Chung Mu Kwan organization, Asian headquarters. John C. Kim's own lawyer admitted to me that there's no such organization. It doesn't exist. Not that I'm aware of. Gallo insists the schools are beneficial to an individual's health and well-being. Is it a cult? No. Are students being conned in these contracts? I am unaware of any con in these contracts at this time. One of the more frightening characteristics of a cult is the physical intimidation used to command loyalty and obedience from members. In Chung Mu Kwan, threats of violence sometimes seem to come straight out of a Bruce Lee movie. A Chicago area karate instructor says he was reminded of this scene when he opened a competing martial arts school in suburban Woodridge in 1982. The instructor says he was invited to a nearby Chung Mu Kwan school where he was greeted by 20 students and their instructor. This person had such power over these people that uh, these people were like uh, robots. They were uh, whatever this man said they would do. Just as it happened in the Bruce Lee movie, Cochran and a friend were surrounded by the students. He says the instructor ordered them to attack. Quick, go destroy them! Kill! In the movie, Bruce Lee wins after fending off dozens of attackers. In real life, the 20 to 1 odds were too much for Cochran. He was beaten by the Chung Mu Kwan students, then threatened by the instructor. And he said, in front of all these people, I promise you that if you open up your school, uh, we will kill you. He threatened to kill you? Yes, he did. Were you scared? Uh, yeah, I was terrified. Cochran was not alone. Police in several suburbs received reports that Chung Mu Kwan followers were harassing and beating up owners of other schools. This former Chung Mu Kwan instructor told us they were trying to put their competitors out of business. We're told to hurt them and we beat them up. Put them on the street, put them in the hospital a couple different times. Why? Because Chung Mu Kwan is a superior art and they were garbage because they knew another style of martial art. Former students and instructors say violence was used to keep them in line as well. They would beat you up physically, you know, if you didn't do whatever they wanted you to do, whether it's sign a contract or open a door or hand things with two hands or 
forget to bow, they would physically hurt you. This student was so frightened of his instructor, he was afraid to quit in person. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. They had swords and knives and spears, and all of those things are very intimidating. This instructor says that when he quit, a supervisor threatened to have him killed. To this day, you're still scared of them? Yes. Why? I don't want them to be killed. There's a lot of people listening to every word that the higher belts say, and they'd do anything, even kill somebody, if they were told to kill somebody. Do you really think that? Sure. You're not exaggerating. Oh, no. You think that if they were ordered to kill, they would kill? Sure. No, it doesn't surprise me that people would uh, act out every single command that the management in Chung Mu Kwan hands out, especially to the instructors, because that is how they're conditioned. They're conditioned to behave on, on command. Several students say they were told Chung Mu Kwan was responsible for the death of Bruce Lee. Lee actually died in 1973 of excess fluid on the brain that may have been caused by drugs. The Chung Mu Kwan version is that Lee was a follower who divulged secrets. This former instructor says he heard what happened to Lee from John C. Kim, the founder of the Chung Mu Kwan schools. And the way that it was said that he was dealt with is that a higher belt from Asia came over, it was a seventh degree, came over and injured without touch. And that he died later from that. He does not believe the story. But what it does tell me is some very scary things about their thoughts concerning people that are what they consider against the organization and how they would deal with that. Greg decided to get out after a Chung Mu Kwan official asked him a frightening question. You willing to give up your life or to risk your life for the knowledge that you can learn? You know, and I was like, whoa, that's weird. He says Chung Mu Kwan has an ominous term for those who quit. And that's what they said to me when I left, is you are walking dead. Chung Mu Kwan officials deny using intimidation, but then they threatened me saying an accident would happen if I reported this story. As a result of our investigation, the Illinois Attorney General's office charged the schools with violating consumer fraud laws, and the Internal Revenue Service is investigating whether all those cash payments were ever reported to the government. Next, death at a religious cult that some call the Killing Temple. We got another Jim Jones. Only it's not Jim Jones, it's Hazel William. In the last 10 years, the Williams Healing Temple has attracted hundreds of members from Chicago's west side. Many of them are poor and sick finding hope in a church that promises financial blessings and medical miracles. But in recent years, many have left the church, disillusioned by the bizarre teachings of the leader they call Mother Hazel Williams. They say Hazel Williams is charismatic and intimidating, able to brainwash believers into following her every command. We found she mixes cult techniques with her own brand of religion to manipulate people into doing things others would find bizarre. Williams has convinced members they don't need doctors or medicine. She's convinced them to go on deadly fasts and to undergo fatal baptisms. And Williams has gone to extraordinary lengths to preserve the image of her church as a healing temple. She's even covered up deaths, prompting some members to call it the killing temple. Hazel Williams' brother is one of her harshest critics. She controlled the people's mind. Whatever she tells them to do, they'll do it. He says people have died because they followed his sister's advice. I want to stop. I'm tired of seeing innocent people dying. William started her church in her home 10 years ago. Corrine Weddington was an early member. Until she joined, she and her son were very close. 
but soon all that mattered were her minister and her Bible. She marked it when she was first baptized in 1979. She would have done anything that Sister Williams wanted her to do. She had that much control over your mother? Yes. She dictated my mother's every move. She gave everything she once held dear to the church, furniture, clothes, and nearly all her money. She made monthly payments to the church from her small veterans benefit, even though her son says there wasn't enough left to pay for food and rent. She gave so much to these people until she just eliminated her life savings. How much do you think? Thousands of dollars. Williams also convinced Weddington to throw out all her medications, refuse to see doctors, and to go on monthly fasts. Her health declined rapidly. Then one night, Weddington called her son to say she was about to be baptized a second time. She said, Sister Williams said, uh, I, I have to be baptized again. You gotta be born again. Was she in any condition to be baptized, to be submerged in water? No way. She was, she was so weak that she had to be carried up and down stairs. In most mainstream Pentecostal churches, such as this one, baptism is a once-in-a-lifetime event. Believers say it heals ailments and washes away sin. I indeed baptize you in the name of Jesus for remission of sins. Amen. For both children and adults, it means being totally immersed in a baptismal pool. But at the Williams Healing Temple, followers like Corrine Weddington are baptized time and time again, regardless of their physical condition. Former church members told us Weddington died during her baptism. How did you know it? Because she wasn't moving, she wasn't breathing. Former church members now admit that acting on Hazel Williams' instructions, they put Weddington's body in a car and drove here to her apartment. Once inside, they changed her clothes, put her in bed, and told the police she died there. So they lied to the police? Lied to the police. And they lied to her son? Lied to the son. Those are the type of people that they are. Leave well enough alone. Leave us alone. Let us have our little cult. Let us kill people and lie, take them to their homes after they die. And then tell you, we're the healing temple. Are they the healing temple? The killing temple. The same thing happened to Catherine Sapp. She'd been baptized at least three times and was in no shape to be baptized a fourth time last June. Her medical records show she'd had a heart attack, emphysema, and suffered from chronic respiratory failure. She always needed an oxygen tank nearby. Her grandchildren say she was afraid to be baptized again because of her heart condition. She told mother when she said, don't baptize me, and, and she was hollering and raising her hand and stuff. What was she hollering? She was saying, no, don't baptize me, she said, because she said she was scared. Sapp bowed to William's pressure, but did not survive the baptism. The cause of her death is listed as cardiac arrest, heart failure. Her doctor says the baptism probably brought it on. That final event was one demand too many on her overstretched cardiovascular system. Her grandchildren say church members changed Sap out of her wet baptismal clothes, then told the police she'd collapse during a regular religious service. As for Hazel Williams... She told us not to um, say anything because um, they wouldn't understand and it would probably be bad for the church. Hazel Williams isolates her followers from outside influences. She says those who challenge her are devils. Those who leave the church are doomed to die. Those who stay are forbidden from associating with non-believers. They must get her approval for nearly everything they do. They cannot wear watches, use attorneys, or watch television. What about the news? What about the people that can't read? What about those people? That helps the people to know 
what's going on in the world. That helped the people to know people like her is a user. Williams preaches that in order to be healed, believers must first demonstrate their faith by refusing all medical care and assistance. What about glasses, walkers, oxygen? Oh, man. No glasses. God, he's your ass. No oxygen tank. No bag for your urine. Just let it run down your leg. God will stop it from running. What about the children and shots and doctors and no, immunization? No, no, no. Don't get shots for No your physicals. Believe God. Glenn Bone remembers what happened one night while riding in a car driven by a devout follower of Hazel Williams. The car began to weave, so he told the driver to stay in one lane. And she just came out to tell me, you know, I can't see. And I said, what do you mean you can't see? She says, I took my glasses off for God and I cannot see. And this, we were, it was dark outside and we were going from side to side. She says, but don't worry about it, I'm praying. God is gonna get us to where we're going. And I just kept saying to myself, you know, I was praying as, you know, she don't know I was praying as hard as she was that we would hurry up and get to a place where this car would stop. The Reverend John Bellamy was trained in the same apostolic Pentecostal church as Hazel Williams. He and other ministers say her teachings violate apostolic doctrine and her instructions are not only irresponsible, but dangerous. What she is doing is abusive, is, is uh, wrong, is illegal. She's jeopardizing the lives of human beings. We are supposed to be helping people to live. Charles Lewis was a member of the Williams Healing Temple and he wanted to live. He had lung cancer. Doctors advised chemotherapy and surgery. Former church members say Williams told Lewis to ignore that treatment. Instead, rub olive oil, blessed by her, over his entire body and pray. He took her advice and he died. Church member Deborah Walker had severe hormonal deficiencies. Doctors prescribed medications and say she had to eat regularly. But after she joined the church, she was told she was healed. She stopped taking medications and went on a three-day fast. As a result, she died a few days later. She was 28. Church member Pam Harris was expecting a baby and needed nourishment. But like all devout followers, she fasted when Hazel Williams told her the Lord said she should. Last year, Harris received Williams' approval to go without food or water for 15 days, even though Harris was four months pregnant. That's unconscionable. Doctors say there was little chance Pam or her unborn child could survive the fast. For a fetus uh, to be deprived of uh, food and water for 15 days uh, by, the, by the mother uh, is tantamount to a death warrant. A death warrant? Without question. On the 13th day, Pam Harris died of dehydration due to fasting. But at Harris's funeral, Reverend Williams defended her approval of the fast. She said God told her he wanted Pam to fast. She said he was pleased. She said God told her he was pleased with that. God is not stupid. He wouldn't tell you to go through a fast and you carrying a little human being on the inside. That's doing. Like other ministers, Williams claims her teachings are based on the Bible. For example, the book of Proverbs. Honor the Lord with the first fruits of all thine increase. In many churches, regardless of denomination, that's the basis for tithing, donating 10% of earned income to the church. But former followers say Reverend Williams demands 10% of everything they receive, including tax refunds, loan repayments, and bank withdrawals, money on which a tithe already has been paid. So essentially you're paying twice. Mm -hmm. Right. That's correct. Did that seem right to you? No, it did not seem right to me. Former followers also say Williams demands 10% of insurance checks received for death benefits, car repairs, or medical expenses. Any dollar that touched your hand, she wanted 10% of it. Bone recalls one woman who got an insurance check for $32,000 to pay a hospital bill. Williams asked for 10%, $3,200. He says Williams had a standard response, 
for those who asked how their bills would get paid if they gave away part of the insurance money. After you give her and the church 10%, then you should pray for where you're going to get the other 10%. And that were her exact words. Pray? Yeah, and let God give you the other 10%. 10, 20, 30, Former followers say Hazel Williams also demands 10% of the food stamps church members receive. But the food stamp coupon books have a clear warning. It's a crime for anyone but qualified recipients to use, acquire, or possess them. There's a black market in stamps. On the street, they can be sold for cash, 80 cents on the dollar. Or they can be used by unauthorized people to buy food at stores that may not always verify that the person using them is authorized to receive them. Pastor Hazel Williams is not authorized as a food stamp recipient, but that apparently didn't stop her from demanding those allocated to her members. She would tell you outwardly in the church service, even though it was illegal, that she expected you to put your food stamps in the tithes. Mother Williams knew it was illegal. Yeah, she knows it's illegal. This woman turned over 10% of her food stamps, even though she had five children to feed. She said, we supposed to, everything we get belongs to God, and we're supposed to get him 10% of it, and that was including food stamps, too. Former followers say church members give because they're afraid. These people were terrified. She would use that God would kill you all the time, is that if you didn't pay your tithes and offerings, God would cut you off. And these God people, would cut you off? And that means to kill you. I think that she is amassing a large sum of money off the backs of poor people who need this money and she's using God to do it. Former associates believe Hazel Williams has used church donations to buy real estate for herself and her family. In the last 10 years, she's put together holdings valued at $360,000. Income properties listed in her name or jointly owned with her children include this house and the smaller one behind it this former restaurant and two flat. She even put her name on the title to the church. In all, Williams has purchased at least nine properties, putting up down payments totaling a quarter of a million dollars. All of the property she's bought, she's bought in her name. Well, she says it's for the church, and that's what the church believes. They don't know that. We showed our findings to the Illinois Attorney General's office. A spokesman said it's illegal for a minister to use church donations for private gain. Our laws require that someone not mix uh, the charity's assets with their own, and they should not put their name on those assets. Former church members say Hazel Williams refused to tell them how church money was being spent. And she would make the statement that uh, this is her and God's church, and she has, she has, uh, no responsibility to tell us what's raised in this church. And if we don't like what she says in this church, you can leave. That's exactly what Glenn Bone did. When I heard her stand up say she was praying last night and God showed her a pink Cadillac with a telephone. And when she said that, I said, well, she, he didn't show that with my money. Hazel Williams refused our repeated request for an interview on or off camera. But as a result of our investigation, she will be talking to the Illinois Attorney General's office which is investigating her possible misuse of charitable contributions, and the Cook County State's Attorney, who's reviewing the deaths we documented to see if criminal charges should be filed. Still to come, a cult using seminars in business management to recruit doctors. The cults are getting slicker, the cults are getting more insidious, and the cults are getting more commercial in how they reach out to people. How you feeling? It takes years of work and study to become a medical professional. Doctors, dentists, and veterinarians must learn anatomy, physiology, biology. More often than not, they don't learn much about running a business. For this dentist, help arrived by mail, an ad for a seminar designed to teach business skills to medical professionals. I increased my gross 29% the first year. Um, and all it was was simple management. He's talking about Sterling Management Systems, 
In slick brochures, Sterling says it can help doctors increase their profits. And Sterling has done well itself. The firm reported sales of $19 million in 1988. In sales videos like this, the founder of Sterling uses charts and graphs to illustrate how its program helps medical professionals take control of their practice. And control equals income. It's based on a work called Management by Statistics by L. Ron Hubbard. But some doctors who signed up for the course had no idea that L. Ron Hubbard is the science fiction writer who founded Scientology. Hubbard said Scientology is a religious philosophy with practical applications that could improve life in today's troubled world. Hubbard claimed to have millions of followers who bought his programs in order to work their way up his so-called bridge to total freedom. But ex-members have said that instead of gaining freedom, they worked like slaves for Scientology and endured cruel punishments for violating Hubbard policies. And the church reportedly has settled multi-million dollar lawsuits filed by ex-members who charged they were brainwashed and the victims of a fraud. Critics say that Scientology is one of the most notorious cults in the country. And that cult is one of the wealthiest, probably one of the most aggressive, and uh, certainly one that damages uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people. It's one of the worst, and it's worldwide. Hubbard died in 1986, but Scientologists continue to implement his programs laid out in countless books and writings. And Scientology continues to flourish, using front organizations to recruit unsuspecting members. Sterling management is one of the most successful. Medical professionals tell us that while Sterling helped them take control of their practices, Scientology tried to take control of their lives. They will manage your practice and they will guide you right into the arms of Scientology. There are many links between Sterling and Scientology. Sterling is licensed by the World Institute for Scientology Enterprises. Sterling is staffed by Scientologists and gets a commission for referring Sterling clients for Scientology services. And Scientology services can add up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm sure that when they saw my partner and I walk through the door with 18 staff members, their eyes were lighting up and they heard the cash registers ring. The owners of this animal hospital were introduced to Sterling at a seminar like this one held in Chicago last month. Impressed, they flew to Sterling's headquarters in Glendale, California for a 10-day course that cost $13,000. There were classes in Hubbard's management methods and practices and a detailed personality test with 200 questions such as, what are your hates and fears? Are you often frustrated or depressed? Is life worthwhile? The doctors were told the test would be analyzed by a specialist who turned out to be a Scientologist with offices at Sterling. What he is in reality is a Scientology recruiter because the purpose is to show you how bad your life is, how Scientology can solve the problems, and sign you up right then and there. The analyst told both doctors that they'd never solve their business problems until they solved their personal problems. Now that you have this problem, you're obviously looking for a solution. You're in the house of solutions. They have it all. You're looking for the solution, and it is provided quickly. And there's only one solution. It is Scientology. Scientology is based on the theories in Hubbard's best-selling book, Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health. Hubbard said it was fact. Critics said the former science fiction writer had created a fictional science. Hubbard claimed that physical and mental problems could be solved through a process he called auditing. The objective? Getting rid of your engrams. Hubbard's word for what most people might call painful memories of unpleasant events. Experts say auditing combines elements of psychoanalysis, confession, and hypnosis. During his 10 years in Scientology, Jerry Whitfield was both audited and an auditor. I think it's sort of like becoming intoxicated 
And one of the first things that happens to a person when they become intoxicated is they lose their judgment. The person is a lot more easily manipulated. A heightened state of suggestibility occurs. Hannah Whitfield, who was also an auditor, says people are urged to talk about their shortcomings and misdeeds. The more one divulges them, and the more completely one divulges them, the, the faster one's spiritual progress will be. The tactic worked on the veterinarians when they signed up for a $2,500 introduction to auditing. They all but praise you for saying something bad. What do they say? Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. That must have been hard. You're doing well. That's nearly, not nearly as bad as, as you made it out to be. While in auditing, this veterinarian believes he was the victim of hypnotic suggestion and imagined that he had been a soldier in a previous life who had attacked a group of peasants. And I remember crashing my hand down, slicing through this guy's neck and feeling my blade lodge in his spinal cord. I saw this event as something that I actually did. In other words, it was a former life. That experience was living on inside of me and it was affecting me even now in my current life. The next step for the veterinarians, a high pressure sales pitch to sign up for another round of auditing that would erase the effects of such misdeeds. The cost, $34,000. The pitch did not always work. When I refuse, there is always plan B, life repair. That's only $3,500 for us more budget-minded shoppers. And <laughs> I signed up for life repair for $3,500. But at 2 in the morning, the pitch did work on his partner when the Scientology recruiter grabbed a tape cassette on the table. He started banging it on the tabletop and and I was already very upset and it was late at night and he started banging this in a, in a rapid fire manner and and it was like whoa I, I, I asked him please stop please you don't realize what that's doing to me what was the effect of that supposed to be he said he was doing it for the to show me how little ability to confront I had how little ability to stand up and fight for myself that I had. And what, I, what, what it made me feel like is, well, I'm just a bowl full of jelly. I believed, based on my experience in the auditing sessions, that I needed to be in control of my life. And that meant spending $34,000. At that moment, it meant spending $34,000. That's incredible. Looking back on it, what it shows me is how controlled I really was by them. I was not thinking with my own mind. And what did they want you to do? Did they want you to sign that night? Absolutely. To pay for this, I signed over my checking account. I signed over my savings account. I gave them permission to get, to, and I signed over permission to get into my kid's college fund. And I maxed out my credit cards. His business partner was shocked at what had happened to his partner in just a few days. He could not make a rational decision. He could not. He, had, he did not have that ability. Former Scientologists say there's another danger, that information given during supposedly confidential auditing sessions may not be kept confidential. Hannah Whitfield told us one way that secrets have been misused. To blackmail dissident Scientologists, to bring them back into line, to try to coerce them from not speaking out negatively against Scientology. And when she worked as a consultant for Sterling, she says she learned the same tactics were used on some Sterling clients. One of them stated that he was blackmailed by the Scientologists. The incident happened when a dentist put a stop payment on a $36,000 check for more auditing. And what was the dentist's reaction? He was shocked. He was immediately and specifically shocked because he thought he had given that information in confidence. Another example, this letter sent by Sterling to a doctor who was demanding a refund. 
it threatens to reveal publicly that the doctor allegedly makes more than he reports to the IRS and is, quote, skimming around $25,000 off the top. One of the most controversial aspects of Scientology is in this book, Hubbard's policy for dealing with people he labeled suppressive persons. His writings define them as anyone actively seeking to damage Scientology. Suppressive acts include suing, asking for refunds, or making anti-Scientology statements to the press. In a policy letter, Hubbard wrote that suppressive persons, or SPs for short, may be deprived of property or injured by any means, tricked, sued, lied to, or destroyed. Hannah Whitfield says she's been declared a suppressive person. And what does that mean, to destroy you? Uh, that literally means to destroy me physically, psychologically, um, whatever. This veterinarian says he was declared a suppressive person for taking steps that ultimately stopped his partner from getting more involved with Scientology. And that he should wake up and realize that I was a suppressive person and treat me as one, as a true evil person. And I can assure you he did. Meanwhile, his partner was being harassed by phone calls from Scientologists several times a day. And if, if I needed to, I would have to separate myself from the effects of those suppressive people. And they were telling you to separate yourself from your partner, separate yourself from your wife. And from anyone who was keeping me away from Scientology. The owner of Sterling Management Systems refused to do an on-camera interview. But in a letter, Kevin Wilson said some of our accusations are half-truths, lies, and exaggerations, dished out by a disgruntled few. He said the charge that Sterling uses client information for blackmail is ludicrous. And he said that Sterling fired the employee who threatened to expose a dentist suspected of being a tax cheat. Wilson said that of their 25,000 clients, only 5% have been dissatisfied. They were given a refund. He said that Sterling does make referrals to Scientology, and that's disclosed in their enrollment contract. He said that what happens during Scientology counseling is entirely out of Sterling's realm. A spokeswoman for the Church of Scientology says their staff are required to follow Hubbard's policies. She said Hubbard criticized hypnosis and was against anything that dulls the mind. She said members are not brainwashed and ex-members are not blackmailed. She said counselors are required to keep information confidential that's divulged during auditing. And she said nobody in the church seeks to destroy anybody, even if they are declared suppressive. Hannah Whitfield says Scientology almost destroyed her. I was psychologically and physically devastated, um, suicidal for the last five years I was in the group, unable to think, unable to logically reason, unable to even state clearly why I had to leave. For 20 years, she was a total believer in Hubbard and rose high in the ranks of Scientology. If I hadn't managed to get away, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure I would have died some way or another. Perhaps taking your own life? Perhaps taking my own life. I came very close to it several times. Millions of people have been affected by cults, and experts say all of us are vulnerable at some point in our lives. They say there's a cult designed to appeal to just about everyone. So what can you do if someone you know is victimized by a cult? Research the cult so you know what you're dealing with. Arrange deprogramming carefully with counselors experienced in mind control techniques. And remember, forced deprogramming is illegal. Finally, Almost all cult victims need some form of long-term counseling to help them readjust. Former cult members describe feeling psychologically raped for believing the lies they were told. They often feel overwhelmed by decisions they must now make in the real world. Some adjust quickly. Others need time to heal. All need support from family and friends so they don't fall back into the clutches of cults and cons. For the Channel 2 investigative team, I'm Pam Zeckman.